speak with the clipper that was here before Chris walked away. <laughs> And here it is. Great. Got to click the back though. Click the back though. Thank you. So I was told that I'm supposed to talk about where we stand in the McCleary case. And it's the, the short answer is very simple. Uh, where we stand, we stand, if I can get this to work now. Oh, I have to turn it on. It's not working. We'll go with plan B, which is used a lot of times. Um, so where we stand is very simple. We stand, it's not even connected. <laughs> there we go. Okay, now will it work? There we go. Okay. So I'll start all over again. Where do we stand? <laughs> We stand firmly on the Constitution, and more specifically, Article 9, Section 1 of the Constitution, which says it's the paramount duty of the state to make ample provision for the education of all children residing within its borders. Now, one of the government's first responses when we filed this lawsuit uh, was, um, you know, the legislative branch is the one that decides what kind of education is going to be provided. Uh, so you, the, the judges in black robes, you just mind your own business and stay out of this. And what the Supreme Court said is, no, no, uh, look, the constitutional mandate here is to the state. There are provisions that talk about the legislative branch and the executive branch and the judicial branch. But this one says the state. That's not just the legislative branch. That's not just the executive branch. That's all three branches. That includes the judicial branch. That is why the Supreme Court in the McCleary case has taken the stand it has to start upholding and enforcing the Constitution. So then the next thing is this, this all children bit. You know, the state's response was, you know, really? Some kids are really difficult to teach. They're really expensive to teach. And, you know, we do a good job with most kids in our state. So most is good enough. And the Supreme Court said, no, no. Uh, it's not just the easier or cheaper to teach children. It's not just most children. All means all, all children. Each and every child in our state, no matter what size school district you're in, no matter what part of the state you're in, no child is excluded. That's what our Constitution mandates. Which then gets to this education work. And, and, this, and the state's argument was, well, you know, education, that just means our basic ed funding formulas, and you know, we fund our funding formulas, so we're complying with the Constitution. And the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. no. Uh, basic education is not the basic ed funding formulas. Basic education is the basic knowledge and skills needed to compete in today's economy and meaningfully participate in our state's democracy. And the state said, well, no, okay, Supremes, how the hell are you going to come up with that? That's a bunch of fluff. And the Supreme Court said, no, legislature, you've already defined it. You defined basic education way back in House Bill 1209, you know, the read with comprehension, write effectively, and order five four concepts of math, science, civics, et cetera, et cetera. Legislature, you've defined the knowledge and skills kids need, and you know, you've gone a step further. There's our state essential academic learning requirements. They're not optional academic learning suggestions. The state specifies them as the academic learning requirements that every child needs to know in today's world. The Supreme Court then went on and said that, you know, legislature, you've then defined the program, the basic ed program that's going to deliver that education, and you enacted. Uh, 2261 and 2776. And you listed out the components of that program, pupil transportation, MSOC, all-day kindergarten, K-3 class size reduction, the specially targeted programs like highly capable, special ed, other kinds of programs like that, the ELL programs, and then compensation that attracts and retains competent personnel. Legislature, you've defined your program of basic education. That's it. So then the, then the state's response was, well, you know this ample provision bit? You know, ample just means adequate. And you know, the, the state was very proud of the fact that when we filed the lawsuit in 2007, there were 296 school districts in the state. 
And by the time we went to trial in 2009, 295 were still left. Only one had gone financially insolvent, so clearly the state funding was adequate. And the Supreme Court said, no, 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 it's not just adequate. Ample is considerably more than just adequate. Which then brings us to this paramount duty thing. The state's argument has been that, you know, paramount duty, that just means uh, like an important consideration. And, you know, we've got a lot of important things we have to balance. Yeah, I mean, we've got tax breaks we have to give to uh, you know, companies and uh, certain interest groups. We've got roads we need to build for voters who want roads. Uh, we've got tunnels to drill in certain cities. We've got all kinds of things we need to balance. And uh, education is just one of those. And that's what this, this clause means. And the Supreme Court says uh, that's not what paramount duty means. Uh, duty is actually a duty. Uh, it's not just a consideration. It's a legal duty. The state must amply provide for the education of all Washington children. It's not a consider, it's a must. And that word paramount um, actually means paramount. It's not just important. It's the state's first and highest priority before any other state program. So it's before the tax breaks, before the roads, before anything else. Paramount duty is the first thing the state has to amply fund. So what is the McClure mandate? The Supreme Court summarized it in one sentence. Article 9, Section 1, confers on children in Washington a positive constitutional right to an amply funded education. A constitutional right to an amply funded education. Just like Brown versus Board of Education said that all children have a constitutional right to a desegregated education, McCleary said kids in our state have a constitutional right to an amply funded education. And the court made it clear that there's a civil rights foundation for this, ruling that education plays a critical civil rights role in promoting equality in our democracy. Amply provided free public education operates as a great equalizer in our democracy, equipping citizens born into underprivileged segments of our society with the tools they need to compete on a level playing field with citizens born into wealth or privilege. And summarizing, education is the number one civil right of the 21st century. Which brings us back to this mandate of constitutional right to an amply funded education. And it's not a constitutional right to an equally funded education. And there are some folks talking about how, well, you know, what McCleary is about is about equity, and so you just have to fund all school districts equally. Um, and that's part of why we should do the levy swipe, or levy swap, they call it. Um, <laughs> we'll just we'll take all the money and we'll redistribute it equally. And you know, frankly, if it were an equal funding bit, uh, the state could comply by funding our schools at one dollar per student. That's equal, but that's not ample. And the idea that somehow McCleary is involved in levy reform and you have to reform levy was brought up by the state and the Supreme Court expressly rejected it. In its August of 2015 order, the court noted that the state contends the matter of salaries have to be tied to reform of the local levy system. That's the only way they can fund it, tied to the local levy reform. And the Supreme Court rejected that, expressly saying local levy reform is not part of the court's enforcement <coughs> order in this case. Which brings us back to the constitutional right to answer <coughs> education. Now this isn't a surprise to elected officials. Uh, back in the 70s, the state Supreme Court in the Seattle School District case said the same thing. Said Article 9, Section 1 requires the state to amply fund the public schools. And after that, there's been decades of talk after the Seattle School District ruling. Uh, Governor Evans, his state of state address, now it's important to provide long-term, consistent, and dependable financing for basic education. Doesn't exist to be raised. We have already delayed too long. Full funding of K-12 is mandated by the courts. We should do it now. Governor Spellman, education is the number one business of the state government. We must finish the work of meeting our mandate to provide fully for basic education. Governor Locke, it's not enough to tell parents that our schools will do better next year. Our students need help now. Governor Gregoire, it is time for bold, purposeful action. It is time to get to work. And Governor Inslee, education is the paramount duty of our state government. No excuses, no exceptions, and excellence for all. And throughout this decades of talk, 
the state also did decades of study. In fact, the Supreme Court notes in its own decision over 100 school finance studies to determine what is the program that delivers a basic education to all kids and how much is it going to cost. So based on these decades of studies, what is this ample funding amount that the state assured the court? Now, going back to trial, at trial, the state had told the court, look, uh, we get it, we get it, we get it, we've passed 2261. That's going to solve all the problems, and we promise we are going to be fully funding it by the, by the year 2018. We promise. And our response to trial was, well, you know, that, that's nice, but that's, there are no dollar numbers in 2261. And so the state's response was, well, we'll put on one of our witnesses who will testify under oath that when this 2018 year comes around, our full funding is going to be $9,710 per student plus compensation increases that are needed, inflation after 2008, and capital construction needs. And when we said, well, but you don't even have those numbers down. The state response was, oh, but the 2261 Technical Compensation Work Group is going to determine the amount that we have to increase salary funding to attract and retain competent personnel. And we're going to fund that. And the state's Supreme Court filings have said that that is at least $2.1 billion a year, which roughly spread out over a million kids, is about $2,100 per kid, which raises this number then to over $11,000 per student. Then inflation, if you just apply the inflation rate that the voters adopted for school funding, which they usually is 732, that raises it then to over $14,000 per kid. For capital construction, the state itself has admitted that, in, in this case, that just building the classrooms you need for all day kindergarten and reducing K-3 class sizes, as the legislature itself has specified, that's going to cost about $2 billion, which spread out over about a million kids is statewide, about $2,000 more per kid. So you're at over $16,000 per kid is what the state has assured the court they're going to be funding by 2018. That, that sort of leaves a big gap, because if you look at the funding level of the school year right before we went to trial, um, that was about 6800 So there's a big gap to fill under what the state has said. So what the state's compliance so far has looked like is, well, that. Um, and in starting in 2012, the Supreme Court said, well, state, every time we pass a budget, you tell us how you're making progress to reach that goal that you said you were going to reach, you, the number you assured us. And in years 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, the Supreme Court's basically been, or essentially been giving them an F every year. 2014, the Supreme Court said, you're in contempt. 2015 and 16, the Supreme Court said, you're still in contempt and started issuing that $100,000 a day sanction. So that brings us then to where we are now. The state Supreme Court itself has said, what remains to be done to achieve compliance is undeniably huge, or to use someone else's pronunciation, huge. Uh, it's undeniable. That's what the Supreme Court itself has said in this case. So where are we going to go this legislative session? Because you notice there are only two years left now. There's that one big gap, which is the first year of the biennium, and that green line, which is the second year of the biennium. Um, if the state were to just hold funding firm at this $9,024 per pupil, and just you know, where would these numbers come from? We have a handout with the uh, with a bunch of information on it, but it will show where these numbers come from and the details where they are from. But the, the numbers in black and red are the numbers the state reported to the Supreme Court. And I know there are different ways to count count numbers and per pupil uh, funding, but the easiest thing for me to do is just use the numbers the state has told the Supreme Court, these are those numbers. And so if they hold the funding level, that's what it would look like. And now let's say that this upcoming budget, the Legislature increases it by $2,000 per kid, brings it up to $11.24. Um, that's still far short of the state's own assurances on what the state said is the funding that's needed to fund and implement the state's own program of basic education to provide all kids a realistic opportunity to meet state standards. It's not a guarantee they're all going to be 
but provides a realistic opportunity. Now, another point that's important here is this is funding above local levies and, and federal funding. So the question is, is would this $11,000, if you increase everything by $2,000, is that net or growth? So for example, if I take away $2,500 per kid of local levy and then give you back $2,000, um, that is a $2,000 increase of state funding. But net, that's less. And that still leaves you far below what the state has assured the court. The state itself has determined that the amount that needs to be funded to provide all kids that realistic and effective opportunity to meet state standards. So what remains to be done is undeniably huge. And the state Supreme Court has said, and this is old, this is from 2012, so this is not five years ago. If the state's funding formula is provided only a portion of what it actually costs the school to pay its teachers, get kids to school, keep the lights on, then the legislature cannot maintain that it's fully funding basic education through its funding formula. Now the state does fund its funding formula, but the funding formulas don't fully fund the actual components of the, of the basic education program that the state itself has set. So what's going to be happening when the court looks at whatever it is the legislature does this upcoming session? It's will the 2000 legislature 17 legislature, fully fund the actual cost of implementing all the components of the state's basic education program. And those are the transportation and sockets that are components the legislature itself has identified. And with respect to transportation, the formula they have now is a lot better than it was when it went to trial. But it still funds the lower last year's actual cost or last year's statewide average. That's not this year's actual cost. And I doubt legislators would say that uh, their, that, that, fund, that pay raise they gave themselves is fully funded if you fund at the amount they got the year before the pay raise. Um, so the transportation is not currently out there today. And sucks. similar situation, you've got statewide averages and they're based on an old snapshot from the 07 08 school year. It's not currently applicable. All day kindergarten, K3 class size reduction. It's partial funding of the personnel costs, partial funding of capital costs, but it's not currently applicable. Highly capable, special ed, other targeted programs, less than the actual student caseload, and it's partial funding of actual personal costs. This is what the funding formulas today are, which are not currently applicable. Compensation to attract and retain competent personnel. Again, partial funding, and schools are facing substantial Substantial teacher shortages, even when you pile on top of it local levy money and federal money. So it's nowhere close to the result. That's where we are today, which then brings up the question well, what if the 2017 legislature refuses to comply with court order? That's contempt, and that's what brought those $100,000 a day bonds, which the state, by the way, isn't paying. But you have to look at what's the purpose of a contempt sanction. The purpose of a contempt sanction is to force the decision maker to choose to comply with the court order by making compliance a better choice than continued non-compliance. Like when the, the deadbeat dad doesn't pay the child support that he's been ordered to pay, the court, the contempt sanction will be to put him in jail. And that's not to solve the problem of the child support, the court order of child support not being paid, it's to give the dad a choice. Stay in jail or obey the court order. He holds the key to his own jail cell. He can just comply with the court order. So two of the contempt sanctions that have been discussed in this case so far, one is give the legislature two choices. Either comply with the Constitution, obey our court order, or choose to have the state's unconstitutionally funded school statute struck down. Like, yes, that closes the schools. But it's entirely the legislature's choice. Which of those two do you want to do? And this isn't something that's made up out of nowhere. This is actually what other state Supreme Courts have done to enforce their court orders when they've told their legislature, the Constitution requires you to fund a certain thing with your public schools, and the legislature says, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, separation of powers, you can't write a check, there's nothing you can do about it. And the courts in those states, Arizona, Kansas, and New Jersey, said, well, you know, 
legislature, we can't write a check, but we can invalidate unconstitutional laws. And that's what we're going to do. First day of school next year, if you don't comply with our court order. Arizona and Kansas, the legislature met in special session and they obeyed the court order. Uh, New Jersey, the legislature said, you guys are bluff. You're not going to do it. Now in New Jersey, that school year doesn't start when the kids go to school in September. Technically, the school year starts July 1 because it runs the same as the fiscal year. So July 1 came around. The Supreme Court stayed in New Jersey, invalidated all the school statutes in New Jersey because the legislature had not complied with their court order. That meant the summer school kids got some more time off, but it also meant the legislature realized the court wasn't walking. And so New Jersey obeyed the court order. Another option that's out there that's been discussed in the briefing is give the legislature a choice either comply with the Constitution or choose to have all the tax exemption statutes passed by the legislature suspended or struck down on the first day of the ensuing school year. Um, that's a viable option, but it's the legislature's choice. Choose one or the other. Um, and I say it's a viable option because if you look at the country, the state that gives out the most tax breaks is New York. And although, you know, there's been discussion about how we rank like 49th and then 45th in the laws of school funding thing, tax breaks, we're number two. And that's why, for example, at the contempt hearing, one of the Supreme Court justices, when the, the state's attorney was pleading poverty, saying, look, we, we just can't afford to obey court's order, uh, the justice said, well, you know, the state enacts, uh, gives out about $50 billion a year in tax breaks, if we just invalidate those tax breaks because if the paramount duty means you have to fund the fully fund the schools first before doing other things like that, you're going to have more than enough money left in that $15 billion to fund the schools and then you can argue about which tax breaks to re-enact. So that leads us to now the final steps on this McCleary Road of where we are. Uh, under the court's most recent order, the October order of 2016, there are four steps left. One, the 2017 session has to enact appropriations to achieve full constitutional compliance by September 1 of, September of 2018. Number two, 30 days after the governor signs that budget, the state has to submit their filings to the court saying that they've done what they've been ordered to do. Three, 30 days after that, the plaintiffs file our response, and I would uh, be surprised if our response is they've done everything they've been ordered to do. Uh, and then number four, after reviewing the party's filings, the Supreme Court's going to decide what to do. Who, who knows what they're going to do? At this point, I don't know what the Supremes are going to do, because frankly, I don't know exactly what kind of plan or proposal or budget that the legislature's going to put together. But I do know that we're going to do a certain There are going to be state officials who argue that the courts usurp the powers of the state legislature and decree you know, separation of powers. Black robed judges think to telling legislators what to do. We're going to hear the state officials say, we can't levy taxes to pay for what the Supreme Court's ruling would require, because it's going to be very expensive. All the other elected officials are going to say, they're just not going to approve a school budget that complies with the Supreme Court's ruling, and there's no quick end in sight. Those are the kinds of things I'm sure we're going to be hearing. Now, this McCleary case is not the first time a court has told the state's elected officials that the Constitution they've sworn to uphold requires them to do something that's very expensive with their public schools and something that most elected officials just politically just don't want to do. Um, the fact that this first quote here is actually, that was the Georgia Attorney General's response to Brown versus Board of Education. The second was the Georgia legislature's response to Brown versus Board of Education. Third was South Carolina legislature's response to Brown versus Board of Education. And the last one was the Biloxi, Mississippi newspaper's headline response to Brown versus Board of Education. So we are going to, I mean, we, we as a country have been here before with the court saying constitutional rights matter. Kids who don't vote, their constitutional rights matter. And the Constitution requires elected officials to do something with their public schools which is difficult and expensive. And what we'll see this legislative session, and when the Supreme Court does whatever it is they're going to do, we're just going to see which side of history the elected officials in 
our state choose to be on. That's all I got.